Good evening. This is the uh, September 23rd, 2020 meeting of the Moscow Planning and Zoning Commission. Welcome everybody. Uh, joining us by Zoom, our chair, uh, Wendy McClure, and also Joel Hamilton. And uh, we're glad to see everybody and that everybody is here and healthy. And I hope that you can hear me okay. Holler if I'm having trouble getting through the mask here. So, um, Item number one, approval from the minutes of uh, the last meeting, September 9th, 2020, and um, Jennifer passed out a revised copy. We made some minor changes. So are there any other additions, corrections, or deletions? Okay, hearing none, now I would entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Oh, Victoria, a second? A second. Okay, then a second, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, they are passed. Next item is our public comment period. Um, unfortunately, there's nobody out in the public, so we will dispense with that, but we would certainly welcome folks to uh, come and join us uh, for our regular meetings. So the uh, next item is a review of the draft sign code, and I guess you're up, Mike. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Uh, before you tonight, we have a review of the, uh, the draft sign code ordinance. So this is the first uh, review of the, the ordinance that we've seen. And if you recall, uh, this kind of all stemmed from a Supreme Court ruling in 2015 uh, called Reed versus the town of Gilbert. It was in Arizona. Uh, it was regarding content-based restrictions on signage. Uh, and then the court's ruling uh, ended up being that, depending upon the sign ordinance, different rules for different categories of signs is content-based. Uh, as long as the categories are defined by the content, topic, or subject matter of the sign's message. So you have you know, a lot of sign codes that up to this point have drawn distinctions between sign allowances for like political signs where you can only display political signs for a certain period of time leading up to the election certain period of time after the election to take those down. Uh, temporary signs were often uh, defined and uh, limited. And then you also had entry exit type of signs as well as real estate signs were specifically called out in a lot of the sign codes. And uh, oftentimes there was different size requirements as well. So uh, taking a look at the result of that uh, ruling, the sign codes have to be content neutral now. So you can't uh, distinguish between s different categories of signs. So if you have different rules for the categories of signs uh, defined by the content of the subject matter uh, of their message, you have to avoid kind of the different size, height, duration requirements for these different types of signs. So political, directional, real estate signs. So, you know, the, the thing I always look at is if you have to read the sign to know what type of sign it is, then that's pretty much illegal now. And then we also have to take a look at the exceptions to regulations to make sure they're not content based. So in all sign codes, they, they have a lot of uh, exemptions in the regulations. So like wayfinding signage, uh, usually entry exit type of signage is exempt. Certain square footage in a window is exempt. Uh, those are kind of common. Uh, rules that you are still able to uh, implement and regulate, so the size of the sign, location, uh, whether it's lighted or unlighted, uh, ones that have a fixed message as well as electronic signs are still allowed, placement of the signs uh, on public private property, commercial residential property, so you're still able to distinguish between uh, kind of the zoning and the use of the property. 
And then you're still up to this point allowed to distinguish between on-premises signs and off-premises signs. So, you know, the example I think around here is, of course, billboards are off-premise signs, obviously. Uh, but for instance, like the Taco Time sign on Third Street, it's not actually on the property where the sign uh, is located. So um, those would be pretty much declared off-premise signs. So I'm sure that there will be further rulings from lower courts uh, splitting hairs on on-premise or off-premise because you know certainly you have to take a look at the sign to determine if it's off-premise or on-premise. So um, I'm up to this point still able to distinguish between the two but uh, likely in the future that may be uh, discussed at the, the, one, of the one of the courts. Uh, still able to regulate certain number of signs per mile of roadway. Uh, rules for imposing time restrictions on signs, advertising a one-time or special event. And then the government, <coughs> of course, is uh, just citing kind of uh, safety welfare, is able to put up signs to promote safety as well as directional signs and signs pointing out historical sites and scenic spots. So we're still able to uh, pretty much list those as some of the exemptions. So taking a look at, you know, just going through our entire uh, sign code and, and kind of following along here uh, kind of begins with the definitions section. Uh, and there's a number of definitions that we need to update. Uh, previously, billboard was <coughs> a bit of an odd place for that. It, it showed up in motor business and industrial zones, and it was called a freestanding sign. Freestanding signs are the large, you know, usually supported by a pole or a couple support structures. Uh, fairly tall in the air, usually around 25 feet in total height, you know, 100 square feet or more. It's a lot of the signs that you see along the highway corridors. Um, and, you know, larger retailers tend to, to put those up and, uh, you know, as well as restaurants. So it was kind of folded into the freestanding sign uh, ordinance under the motor business and industrial. And it was just confusing because it was still called a freestanding sign, uh, but it was, you know, you're still able, and it had all the, the requirements for spacing uh, and things like that, but it was just underneath that section, kind of hidden. So um, we needed to pull that out of, of that section and define what a billboard is, uh, first of all. And uh, so that's what we've done, inserted the definition of a, a billboard, really a permanent sign on which space is leased or rented to display a message not affiliated with the use of the property and regulated by section L below. Um, so we just pulled that out of the motor business and industrial section and made it its own section, but we really haven't changed any of the billboard regulations, uh, or, or we haven't changed them in this draft ordinance. Um, and then just dynamic display sign. So this, you know, really as a result of tri-state sign a number of years ago, developed dynamic display regulations, and now we limit those to certain areas of town. Uh, and where, so these are the large LED uh, able to be changed, you know, um, electronic displays. And uh, so we have, you know, regulations for those as a result of that. Uh, and, but we do have a, a section, so it's a sign capable of displaying words, symbols, figures, or images that can be electronically or mechanically changed by remote or auto means. We had a section at, at the end of that definition that exempted out uh, the ones that have current time, date, temperature, uh, do not contain any copy or commercial message within the dynamic display portion of the signs, does not exceed 10 square feet, shall not be considered dynamic display signs for the purposes of this code. Um, you know, as a result of the, the Supreme Court ruling, I think we need to strike that, basically, pretty much because it's content-based. It's saying that if you it contains these items, then it's uh, you know doesn't qualify as that type of sign. So. Um, that's the only change to the dynamic display sign uh, definition. And then we need to insert an off-premise sign. So right now, um, same deal with the billboards. We have a, it, within that section, it, you know, one of those words is plural there, so it allows for multiple uh, signs on a, on a single lot. And it doesn't say that it has associated with that specific use. And so it's really just the language within the different sections. And we needed to, when we switched this around and created more of a table instead of a narrative form, we couldn't really draw that distinction in, in the table. So 
uh, we needed to define what an off-premise sign is. And so still planning on you know, allowing that in the zones that we currently allow it in, which is motor business, industrial. Um, so we'll, we'll update that a little bit later. But yeah, off-premise sign, a sign relating through its message and content to a business activity, use, product, or service not available on the premises upon which the sign is erected. And then uh, eliminate political campaign signs. So uh, just eliminating the definition of a political campaign sign since we can't draw that distinction anymore. Uh, so that brings us to the exempt signs section. So this is going through you know, all the signs that are essentially exempt from getting a sign permit. Uh, and then they're allowed in addition to any other signage that's on the site. You know, a lot of these signs are generally in the public right of way. Uh, governmental signs, so signs installed on behalf federal, state, county, city government to pro on the protection of public health, safety, and general welfare. So they're saying that, you know, as long as it's really associated with general, you know, the public health, safety, and general welfare, still able to specifically state governmental signs and draw a distinction there. So emergency warning signs necessary for public safety or civil defense, traffic or wayfinding signs erected and maintained by an authorized public agency, uh, signs required to be displayed by law, signs showing location of public facilities, including public and private hospitals, emergency medical services, uh, any sign posting notice or similar sign placed by or required by a governmental agency and carrying out its responsibility to protect the health, safety, and general welfare. Interpretive memorial signs, names of addresses and buildings, stained glass windows, dates of building construction, uh, signs of public utility companies indicating danger, Changes to the face or copy of changeable copy signs. So these are, you know, dynamic display signs. Uh, some of the uh, the reader board type signs that uh, have that display. You know, obviously you're able to change that because it's meant to be changed. And then just specifically saying the normal repair maintenance uh, of conforming or non-conforming signs does not involve structural alteration or exempt. Uh, sculptures, fountain, mosaics, murals, public art, design features are not a sign. Uh, no trespassing, no parking private. Sign identification, essential, uh, essential public needs. So publicly approved, non-eliminated interpretive historical signs or tablets and displayed by a governmental agency. And then interior signs. So you know, usually if you can't see it, it's not regulated. So all the signage on the inside of the mall doesn't matter. It's, uh, the mall is really in control of that. Uh, we're just really Amen. concerned with uh, signs. What's the difference between a, go back to the uh, last one, okay, uh, interpretive, and, and then it says, oh, interpretive, hmm, memorial. I was trying to think, oh, I suppose number eight would fit the signs we have out in front of City Hall, huh? It would, yeah. Yeah, good question, Nels. I was wondering the same thing because an eight and a two seem yeah, it's kind of a duplicate there. We yeah, we could uh, certainly pro uh, strike maybe one of them. <laughs> Leave names and addresses of buildings, stained glass windows, dates of building construction. I think that's more intended to be kind of on the building itself in uh -huh. number two, not necessarily freestanding, but I think it would cover both of them. So. Uh, yeah, I could try to consolidate that a little bit more. It does seem redundant. Question? So I can't think of what you mean by stained glass. I know what stained glass windows are, but stained glass window signs, I'm confused. Saying that it's exempt. So if you have stained glass and maybe there's some type of uh, religious scripture written on, written oh, on it, okay. then it, it's not a sign. Okay, gotcha. Typically, it's hard to see them from the outside. <laughs> yeah, it's really more intended for inside. You're uh, inside and looking. Jesus yeah. stilling the water, as you know. Yeah. So that, that covers the exempt signs. Uh, we need to go through, eliminate real estate sign regulations. So we've done that. Uh, and then we have this section on non-conforming signs that's always been probably something that I shouldn't admit that we overlook just because it's, you know, really onerous. So it states that any entity with a non-conforming sign on a lot or property may not add additional signage of the entity until every sign on that entity of that lot or property property is brought into conformance with the sign code. So that's saying that if you have a 
say a freestanding sign that's too close to the right of way, you're not able to add any other signage, whether it be on the building, portable sign, anywhere on that property until you take that sign down and relocate it. And it, it's just something that probably was written with that person not enforcing it or you know not having work there long after that so it's just been a challenge to you know it's really a little bit heavy-handed and, and so we're planning on striking that in the in the proposed ordinance uh, subdivision entrance identification signs so um, right now that's something usually just pops up you know really people you typically don't even get sign permits for those types of uh, subdivision entrances and in our code currently it says that you've got to get a conditional use permit which is a public hearing before the Board of Adjustment in order to have a subdivision entrance uh, identification sign so uh, we're just planning on saying that you know you don't need a CUP it's, it's just limited to the sign regulations of the zoning district which it's located in uh, and just leaving it at that. I don't know that I've ever processed a CUP for <coughs> a sign of an entrance of a even a multifamily complex. So uh, just trying to eliminate the onerous aspect to that one as well. Uh, and then this is you know a large aspect of these sign code amendments, uh, trying to come into compliance with the Supreme Court decision. A lot of it de uh, deals with temporary signs. So looking at temporary, you know, usually under the definition of temporary signs, you have real estate signs, uh, you have political signs, you have yard signs. Uh, maybe it's a sign that, um, you know, people display year round, you know, the, the signs that are common that says, you know, wherever, no matter where you come from, you're still our neighbor. Uh, those would be essentially a temporary sign. You can also have temporary signs that uh, are grand opening type signs. Uh, sale signs you know a lot of businesses have banners and and you know now leasing signs uh, on you know um, property management company so there you know can come in a lot of forms and so uh, previously we had you know kind of those distinctions between real estate and political we had to get rid of those so now you know we're looking at and before it was our code was really silent on a lot of those signs so if you did have one of those yard signs that you displayed year-round technically those probably weren't allowed underneath the, the current code and so it's trying to go through and and recognize a lot of the signs that people do have especially in residential areas and try to you know make sure that we weave that into the regulations so that we're not going to create an issue with what's pretty much popular uh, in the city today so looking at residential zoning districts uh, maximum so we propose maximum of six square feet of total si area per sign shall be permitted on private property uh, and so that's just per sign so that pretty much mirrors what the typical real estate uh, political sign size currently is in our code and then we'd say a maximum of one sign is permitted per lot except that's provided in section C below. And so we just, that was kind of a baseline. You know, a lot of people, if they're displaying one year round, it's, it's typically one. Sometimes you see more. We could certainly up that if you felt that uh, that was, you know, something that uh, we think we should do. Uh, and then there's this, you know, section C here is really addressing the political signs, but not necessarily calling them political signs. So saying that there shall be no limit on the number of temporary signs displayed on private property during the time period between 60 days preceding the first day of primary election or vote for office or ballot measure and seven days following the day of final election or vote for office or ballot measure. So that's currently what we have in, our, in the code as far as political signs, but that's, you know, that with the Supreme Court ruling, you still have to address them, but it, it's always just in this kind of roundabout way where you're not specifically calling them political signs. So these are, you know, just regular residential properties. You're entitled to one year round of that size, but 60 days leading up to the election, seven days after, there's really no limit on any of those. So even if you choose to not, you know, put up a, a large number of signs, but they're not politically affiliated, 
you're still able to do that and we can't say that you can't do that you know we can't say that they have to be associated with some type of election of office so you know that's how we had proposed to kind of address the political sign aspect to the temporary signs question yeah so right now it's popular to have uh, well Lata recovery centers got a sign got a series of signs going out there like your life matters or something like that you've got um, some other thing black lives matter that's I got one in the neighborhood that I see that there's several you might have more than one in a yard I'm not saying I care or don't care but I don't want to get in trouble with the Supreme Court so I'm bringing it up you know that that typically you'd have one of those signs but you could have several yeah and certainly you can you know there's no trouble there I mean it, it can certainly allow as many as we want to we could say that there's no limit mm. you know somebody can put 20 of those in their yard year-round and that's something that we don't want to regulate so that's that's the question we just uh, yeah, that's you question. know typically uh, most people I see have one mm -hmm. some people have more than that so that's just uh, you know and, and these aren't necessarily you know, a lot of our regulations, you know, we don't have anybody driving around counting yard signs. True. A lot of them are, are complaint basis, but certainly if it's in the code, it could be enforced. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's something to think about. How many signs do we, you know? To me, it, if you say 20 of those in a yard, that turns into clutter. <laughs> Yeah, that that you know, but and that's why you limit it. Is, yeah, you know, you try to avoid, especially in residential areas, clutter. And so, you know, what what what's kind of a good number yeah. that seems reasonable in allowing those types of signs? So, maybe it's two, maybe it's three. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question on that? Sure. Does it does it make a difference if, say, I have three signs like? I love my Boy Scouts the best, my Girl Scouts the best, and I have the best dog in the world, and I want them all out there. And you say, you can only have two. If I move one to my backyard and I rotate them, does that count, or is that both yards? My whole, is it a whole private property, or if I move them, does that matter? Typically, I mean, usually this is just from public view. Okay. So if you have one in your backyard, nobody can see it except for the occupants of the... Yeah, but it's an alley. I mean, I'm not trying to get too sure. No, no. Sure. I mean, the Supreme sure. Court's being pretty picky, so I want to make sure we're thinking well, about it. Well, you know, I mean, it, I, I could take a look at it. It's either, I don't believe it's in ours, but I've seen other ordinances where they only regulate signs that are visible from a street. Okay. So, I mean, we could Great. certainly... Like a corner you know, I don't think, it, you know, I mean, we're not obviously gonna not gonna have an issue with a backyard where you can't see it uh, it's mainly just gonna be in the front adjacent to the street but we could certainly clarify that just to make sure there's no gray area as I far can, as I just see someone asking yeah. that question so yeah. Sure. yeah it's more like not so someone who's someone else who's who's wondering if it's okay or wants to take issue to kind of get that out front so that it's doesn't so that it's already clear I mean is there an issue that we're trying to regulate by saying whether it's one, two, three, five, do we even need to say that uh, how many are permitted? Can we just go silent on the issue? You can s certainly say that there's an unlimited permitted year round. Yeah, you well, can certainly silent do that. Is I mean, not even saying anything, just cross that one but, out. Well, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Whatever we say is arbitrary. And no matter, we're, we're going to select the number that we think is, is correct, and I'm not sure that, I, I guess well, I have some concerns about us yeah. doing that. I mean, if, it's, if we do do that, uh, however, then uh, uh, that makes uh, point C irrelevant. Uh, there would be uh, no uh, time limits on the, uh, on the temporary uh, uh, political or otherwise signs. But is, well, that's to. a good point. But isn't the um, isn't that regulated uh, outside uh, city code? Uh, isn't there either state or um, isn't there some other controlling factor about the sixty days, or is that strictly in Moscow code? 
It's in Moscow code. Um, I think there's other rules that have the same time frame for political campaigning, but I don't know that it specifically states. I think it maybe says that you can't campaign. Sandra may know a little bit better, but yeah, I could certainly find out, but I believe that um, it's pretty much the local local ordinance okay. that dictates that. I think we talked at one time, one sign per X number area of a yard, you know, 30% of the yard or 30 square, I don't know numbers. I don't know that I want to go there. It sounds awfully detailed, but I think we talked about that at one point and didn't go there, obviously. Well, maybe we do just pick a number that we think is reasonable and move forward with that and see where we, where we go. What if we had, um, unless determined otherwise by the zone administrator? You, you could, <laughs> yeah. you don't want to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> well, I, I guess, I think that one is, I, I see a lot of places that have more than one sign. Yeah, I think so one's I think too limited. We need okay. to okay. certainly accommodate more than that, but. Um, yeah, I mean, the concern is clutter, aesthetics, uh, you know that that's really the the only concern you point to. Um, you know, I think everybody agrees probably twenty is too many, but maybe one is not enough. So, you know, maybe we arrive at uh, three, four. Yeah. You know, so maybe somewhere you know in the middle there. Three sounds like a good number to me. <laughs> it seems I, like I don't it. like. I would not like the idea of. Uh, uh, political or otherwise signs that are covered under C uh, becoming uh, perpetual. Yeah. Uh, that uh, that would that would be clutter in my view. <laughs> well, it's got sixty days. So you're not. I I like the sixty days. So uh, with subsection B there, maybe changing it to three and then we can future meetings bat that around a little bit to see if you know i mean it'd probably be good to maybe now is not the best time of year to gauge how many <laughs> signs people have in their yards but you can see the other signs that aren't affiliated with a you know a politician seems to me uh, michael uh, if we could get you to uh, go out with your camera <laughs> i would certainly love to see three or four or five examples of things that uh, illustrate some uh, uh, issue because, you know, we've got the fluttery signs uh, that are going on and, and in theory, I guess they're temporary. Uh, they don't last too long before they fray, but it's hard to put your mind on it without looking. An image would be uh, helpful to deal with the uh, with the the uh, commercial zone uh, issue, I think we ought to. Uh, it'd be you could pick out a couple of good examples that would uh, be helpful. Okay. Well, in this particular case, we're we're kind of residential. This part of the discussion is for residential only, correct? Oh, it's commercial it's zoning it's district commercial. number two. Well, uh, no, I no we're we're under one. <laughs> oh, we're right talking now. about one. Yeah, yeah. we're well, about I mean, to transition I, to commercial I, there, but I I'm thinking about you know multiple houses that that have uh, several signs, one about love thy neighbor, all that kind of stuff, and and then uh, everybody's welcome to stay here. I mean, they have those t thematic groups and, and they might have two or three of them. And, and to some degree, depends on how close into your face on the pub in the public realm they put them. A lot of people just put them right up near their porch or something or their front door. So it's a little, seems a little different than out in the, you know, at the edge of the property line, so. Uh, but it seems like maybe up to two. I think it, if it gets beyond that, it's quite a bit. So. Well, Mike, why don't we why don't we start with the two, 
and we can have some additional discussions as we move forward with the with okay. that. I can take some pictures of uh, right around where I am right now of multiple signs in a yard and send them in several yards and send them to Mike to, to or I can bring them to the next meeting actually so yeah okay uh, and then we go through commercial zoning districts so this is like similar to residential districts kind of mirroring the size limitation that we currently have uh, for like political signs real estate signs so a maximum of 32 square feet of total sign area shall be permitted on private property. A maximum of one sign is permitted per lot, except as provided within section C below. And so another qualifier for some type of election, so 60 days prior and uh, seven days after the uh, election voter ballot measure. And so uh, commercial zoning districts, so we, we still needed to weave in the signs that usually aren't some type of real estate or political like the sale signs or grand opening signs and so right now what we say is that if you have a grand opening sign or if you just you know have have a sign that's not associated with a grand opening you're allowed essentially 15 days with no limitation on size for a you know whatever it is temporary signs usually a banner uh, but you can have another one time extension of 15 days. So essentially you have 30 days per year to display a temporary sign on your property. Uh, if it's a grand opening sign, it's essentially 60 days, 30 days, and then you can request a one time extension up to 60. Um, it's always been pretty short in our minds as far as displaying a sign like that. And obviously we can't draw a distinction anymore between a grand opening sign and just a, any other sign. Um, so we're trying to, you know, weave that into the regulations as far as these commercial lots, you know, the types of kind of temporary banners that we, we should allow, you know, kind of continue to allow there. We do have a temporary sign permit now, and it's, you know, quite a bit cheaper than the, the standard permanent sign. And the only reason we require a temporary sign permit is to keep track of the number of days that you display it because it has that limitation in the code. Um, but a lot of people come in and get a temporary sign permit just to, you know, for their special events that they have. And so the subsection D is trying to incorporate that. So more, more than one temporary sign. So this is essentially saying that based upon subsection A, you can display really one of these special event signs pretty much year round if you want to or you can change them out you don't need to get a, a, a sign temporary sign permit for it um, but if it exceeds the 32 square feet then you're required to obtain a temporary sign permit and it may be displayed for a consecutive period not to exceed 45 days so we just upped it from the 30 and kind of split the difference between the 60 uh, per year except as provided within subsection C below so, you know, that was our, you know, it seems to have kind of eased that up a little bit as far as, you know, requiring a permit for a temporary sign. If you stay within the 32 square feet, you know, you're pretty, like I said, you're pretty much able to change that banner out or whatever it is. You're allowed one um, year round. And then if you either go above that square footage or you have more than uh, one temporary sign, then, uh, you pretty much just have to come in and get a, a temporary sign permit just to keep track of the 45 days per per year. This is probably another dumb question on that, but what about like at, at large places like I'm, I'm thinking like at BCI where there are multiple entrances and if they have a welcome sign but then if they also have a special event and they put special event signs out for a couple days would they have to get a temporary sign for those special event ones if you already have like welcome signs? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess technically you would just based upon the number of temporary signs. So more than one temporary sign, you know, if those welcome signs. So underneath every zone, you're going to be allowed some amount of permanent signage. So if your welcome signs are permanent, I mean, they're essentially, you got a sign permit for it mm -hmm. there year round. 
and uh, so that doesn't count as like your temporary signs. Oh, okay. So if you're, you know, you have the yeah. permanent welcome sign that's there, even though it may not be completely made of permanent material, but it's there year round, uh, you know, pretty much secured to the ground in some manner, then uh, that doesn't count as a temporary sign. You're able to have, you know, these temporary signs for those special events. If they don't, you know, depending upon what the zoning is, if it's in commercial zone, uh, PCI is going to be in a, you know, a, a residential zone, yeah. so it's going to be a little bit diff different regulation. I was just thinking those big, like I know the Coos Land Trust has some areas that are in town that have multiple entrances, and anyway, it's, that's okay, I just, I didn't want anyone to get in trouble for having a sure. semi-permanent sign. Sure. Okay. And yeah. I guess that's another question, because we're going to have kind of those institutional uses in residential zoning districts. So we're probably going to have to add a similar section to section D he, uh, underneath commercial zoning districts to the residential zoning districts or else the more, you know, churches, PCI, you know, type type uses that are in residential zones aren't going to be able to display any type of temporary signage like that for special events. So yeah, well, we'll, have, we'll likely have to add. That's something probably need to do. So speaking of churches, a lot of churches will have a marquee sermon. This Sunday is blah 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 blah. They'll have Black Lives Matters or Everybody Is Welcome. will have one of those, and they could have an event sign or something like that. So easily up to three signs, really quick. Would they be required to get a permit? If we're back up to the residential and adding the section that you're talking about up for residential, would would that require a permit as well? Um, no, the, these signs would not okay. require a permit. No, the only permit that would be required is if they in the commercial section okay. went above the square footage or they had more than one. And on uh, commercial item D, I, I want to make sure I understand the consecutive period not to exceed 45 days per year. Does that mean they only get a total of 45 days a year? Correct. So they can have it up for 30 days and then they'd be allowed another 15 days um, at some point in time. But the total of 45 is on an annual basis. Well, it's the way it reads is consecutive period. So I would say that it'd have to be 45 days. You wouldn't be able to separate it out. But we could strike consecutive. I just really copied that language from our current temporary sign regulations for consecutive. But the issue here is keeping track of 45 days per year. You know, if somebody we don't say consecutive and they come in and get the permit for it and we start the clock at 45 days you know it's not going to be worth our time to have them call in say hey I put it up for two days and create a tally in right. our office I, you know it's just not going to be a, a good use of staff resources to try to keep track of it that way right um, so that would be the concern with taking the consecutive off no I, the way you're describing it I, I would leave it up there I think uh, and given that, let's say they came in, got a temporary permit, had it up for 30 days, and then took it down. If they wanted to do another 15 days sometime later in the year, they'd have to come in for another permit, I, I presume. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's just leave it. That's fine. I just wanted yeah. to clarify that. So, Michael, I was, I was uh, getting ahead of myself. I was thinking about commercial zones when I talked about pictures. I'm... I, I don't even know what I'm uh, thinking for residential. That's uh, so I, I was just uh, a couple of paragraphs uh, got ahead. Okay. And those portable, I think you're referring, if you're thinking of like the feather signs. Yeah. So those are going to be a little bit different. Those aren't going to be, uh, we're going to call those portable signs, similar to like the A frame signs. So I view those as kind of in between a permanent and a temporary sign. So we'll, yeah, we can go through what kind of the definition of those are, but it's typically the A-frame uh, sandwich board signs that 
you see mostly in downtown those are portable signs but then we did draw the distinction between kind of the A-frame sandwich board signs and the feather type banners uh, that was when we worked through that with uh, Mr. Mitchell uh, over at Jiffy Lube because of his concern there and we changed you know our, our portable sign regulations a few years ago so that was the result of that but um, but yeah it, so there's a little bit of difference there between those types of signs and these temporary signs which are going to be more like the banner displayed on the wall or maybe on a couple of uh, fence posts into the ground type of thing and and those are specified in the number 16 in the definition section that calls out portable sign yeah they are yep yeah. okay and that brings us to the third aspect of temporary signs temporary signs in the right-of-way so right now we we essentially say that you know you're not allowed to have any sign in the right-of-way except for signs in central business for instance portable signs um, and all signs have to be on private property so this isn't reckon you know this is an attempt to recognize the signs that we do get in the public right-of-way that are usually associated with a special event so the most common ones being a real estate open house sign that you see around town uh, they're at typically street intersections directing you know pedestrians and drivers to where the open house is for the house so those are the you know the ones that we see the most uh, and this is really to uh, you know but the, certainly there's yard sale signs that you see also that usually on one day a week uh, they set them up kind of street intersections as well you know they're not doesn't do a whole lot of good to have one right at the front of your house because people can see you've got the front yard full of stuff and and that's you know it's a yard sale so people put them off site and so that's a, another type of off site or off premise sign um, and so this is an attempt to recognize and, and uh, allow some types of signage that's not on private property. So these types of temporary signs shall be permitted in the city right away subject to the following standards. So looking at a similar size uh, sign as uh, six square feet total sign area. So this is regardless of whether it's in commercial or residential, you're, you're going to li be limited to six square feet in total area and a maximum height of three feet uh, per sign. Maximum of four signs are permitted per event for which the signs are advertising. So, you know, you've seen some examples probably where some companies had four per intersection, which, you know, I think in our, in, in staff's minds is entirely too much or overkill as far as a, uh, a an open house sign. So. This would allow for, you know, possibly four intersections directing to the to the open house, um, and of course, if it was on private property, you could certainly have the signs saying "open house here." Uh, and those would be covered by the previous section that talks about private property. So, yeah, looking at limiting it to four uh, may only be displayed during the day of the event. Must be removed within two hours after the event's taken place. Uh, sign is entirely outside the roadway and one foot away from the curb uh, does not obstruct the sidewalk and shall maintain at least four contiguous feet of unobstructed pedestrian access uh, does not obstruct pedestrian or wheelchair access from the sidewalk to transit stops ADA parking spaces ADA access ramps or building exits including fire escapes and then it should not be placed upon any city owned or maintained structure in the public right of way, including by limited to street sign, traffic control device, utility pole, hydrant, fence, lamppost, guardrail, tree, or other vegetation. So that's really, you know, we have certain sections of our code that already cover that. So that's, I think, found in the police regulations as far as not, a, you know, not uh, tacking them or, or uh, securing them some way to like a utility pole is, is quite common. And so the police department usually goes around and handles that. But uh, yeah, just trying to allow these in a, a limited quantity for these types of special events in the public right away, um, and just making sure that they don't get out of hand. Does four seem like enough, though? I mean, I, I just feel like, I don't know, that doesn't 
seem like enough to me. If, if they're advertising my house for sale, and if there was, I mean, if it was especially like on like a difficult to find street or something, I mean, four doesn't, I mean, to me that doesn't seem like Okay. Enough, yeah, I mean, that, that was just kind of a baseline, certainly worthy of, you know, increasing it I mean, discussion. Four one intersection, obviously, is overkill. Is overkill, like, yeah. Or like one at every intersection all the way down Mountain View. Going, I mean, yeah, you know, like I, yeah, yeah. I mean, we could any any you know. Any also, it also seems like you'd be setting yourself up for getting a lot of phone calls every weekend for open houses. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, the problem with with these is that they usually ha occur on the weekends and they're removed by the time you know you get you get to the the work week. Right. So they're hard to track down, um, but there have been instances, you know, I, I'd say generally there's not that big of a, an issue with them. You know, there, there have been um, some, you know, one particular real estate company that has toned it down substantially. And, uh, but there were some examples of, you know, multiple intersections where there were four, I mean, uh, probably putting out in the twenties or thirties as far as number of signs, you know, and that just, uh, you know, is just beyond a, in, in our mind reasonable as far as the, the you know the number of signs. Right. But you know, part of this is just recognizing that right now we don't allow them at all, and they've just kind of occurred for all these years, and and uh, you know, recognizing that they are going to occur, and just making sure that they're going to be legal. You know, the ones that are out there. So, but yeah, I mean, that we weren't married to four. That was just seem like a kind of a good number to start at but certainly whatever the commission would like to do as far as increasing that certainly can what what number were you thinking rich that you think was uh would be i, don't, I was just trying to run through my head six like, eight yeah, kind yeah. of double that yeah something like i mean yeah maybe another sub bullet saying no more than one per one intersection per type of that. thing yeah for sure i mean that seems i don't think you need more than one per yeah. intersection yeah yeah but i can see how i'm trying to come up with a complicated area to get to where yeah you could i could see how you could take up four in one sure. part of town just to sure. find the place you know yeah yeah but some some places are in hard hard locations to to reach for what's more on your street name does that sound reasonable to everybody else? Maybe yeah. Yeah, I increase agree. the number, but say only one per intersection? Yeah, type? I think that's a good way to... I think that's it. better. Joel, was that you? Yeah, I, I was just saying I think that's better. There's one, one question running through my mind. Uh, all of this uh, section is talking about the city right of way. Are they any issues with regard to uh, 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 other land that is not a city right-of-way uh, such as city uh, city parks uh, uh, city-owned land uh, where uh, the same uh, restriction might apply well yeah I mean it I guess it doesn't ex explicitly say that, but um, you know, I, I think it, it may be inherent in subsection G about you can't place it on city-owned, you know, it says or maintained structure. I think that would apply to city-owned property as well. I mean, we wouldn't, certainly wouldn't give permission to put those types of signs on city property, but you know, we could specifically say that city-owned property. As a I, I was thinking of that change as a possibility. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, we could kind of weave that into subsection G, as far as uh, you know, shall not be placed on any uh, city-owned or maintained. You know, maybe city-owned property or maintained structure yeah. in the city. So you know, add kind of property in there as well. Yeah. Yes. I'm not sure that it has been a problem. I, I've not seen that uh, myself as being an issue, but uh, I can imagine it might be. Well, I think that, 
if they are placed, they're just usually removed by the parks department uh, shortly <laughs> after they're after they're uh, placed. But yeah, I, I'll uh, I can make that change, and then I can talk to our parks department and see if they've had any issues with that occurring, and maybe tweak the language a little bit. Okay. I guess I'm, I was wondering whether there is any uh, city-owned property that is not legally a right of way along some of our uh, uh, streets. <laughs> I'm sure we have slivers in some places, um, but they, you know, it's hard to kind of tell a distinction between the right of way mm -hmm. and then those pieces of property. So right. I think it would be good to add that in there about city property. I mean, obviously, parks, you know, is kind of the first thing you think of is East City Park, third, you know, Third Street displaying those, you know, obviously we don't want all those signs popping up in East City Park. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure we have, you know, we have uh, booster stations, lift stations, you know, all, all of those happen to be usually right up adjacent to a street. And so you could see that, you know, some may be placed in those areas, but... I, I think that, yeah, if we add property in there, I think that would kind of alleviate that. I like that. Any other thoughts? On, no, on that's this? good. Okay. Um, so right now, murals. Um, so if it doesn't constitute a sign, then they're really exempt. So you have artistic murals, some of them weave in, so like the, I guess maybe one of the prime examples is CJ's, the old bunnies on the back, you know, that was kind of the logo of CJ's. And, you know, if it's a mural like that, that is affiliated with some type of, you know, mascot or, you know, a business kind of name is in there, then typically those are declared wall signs. If it's just a, a piece of art, so the ACLU banner on the back side of uh, the Moscow Hotel, you know, doesn't point to one particular entity. It's just a kind of a free speech mural. Those are exempt. So you don't need to get a sign permit. You know, there's really no limitation on the size of those. Um, and so that's kind of the distinction on, on murals, what makes it a sign or as, a, you know, as opposed to a mural. Um, and so we just kind of clarified that as far as whether or not it's a mural or a sign. Um, and then if it is declared a, 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 uh, a sign by the zoning administrator, there's a process by which you can go apply for a conditional use permit in order to have a larger sign than what's permitted in the underlying zone. So not really changing that section just kind of clarifying that if it's determined to be a sign then this is what's allowed mike can i ask you a question on that so for example as you drive into town down main street on some of the historic buildings you see big you know old advertisements that were part of the sort of history of the building that are in people sometimes maintain those and repaint them is would that fall into this artistic mural or would it be in somewhere else like historically significant signs or <laughs> where would it fit? Do you know what I'm talking about? I do, Just, yeah, we do. Yeah. I lost you. Uh oh. I, yeah, I was just looking through the words. I mean, we do have oh, okay. right below that historically significant signs. You know, yeah. I, I think that it would certainly apply to that, but if we go okay. to you know, the definition section again, we look at the definition of mural. So it just says it doesn't qualify as a sign. A sign, if you look at the definition of, of what a sign is, Yeah, so I, I guess, you know, even though that entity is not on site, so a presentation display or representation of words or letters 
or of so this is pretty much trying to cover everything right so or of as a figure design picture painting color pattern mm -hmm. logo emblem symbol trademark or other representation so as to give notice advertise call attention to or identify an entity so it doesn't really draw a distinction as to whether that entity it still exists or not so i would say that that yeah technically i guess is still a sign if, even if it is of historical significance and, and doesn't advertise a use that currently exists. Um, so yeah, that, you know, it would just be declared a, a sign would not be a mural and it would just be, you know, typically you don't have an issue with fixing that, you know, I mean, it, under the maintenance section, if you wanted to touch that up, I, you know, it's certainly not going to require a sign permit in order to be able to do that. And you certainly should, could have it. Um, but that historically significant sign would certainly apply to it. So, you know, maybe repaired or relocated regardless of applicable zoning district and non-conforming regulation subject to the issuance of conditional use permit. So, um, okay. Yeah. So that, yeah, I mean, that, that would really cover all those aspects. I, I think that that, you know, is thinking more along the lines of a large freestanding sign. Maybe the Royal Motor Inn is probably the one that comes to mind, uh, you know, that with the, you know, I'd say that that probably has historic value or maybe the Moscow right. Hotel, the sign that's in, on the inside of the garden that was the old Moscow Hotel sign. That probably would, you know, if it were to be relocated out in the public somewhere that would require a permit, you know, you certainly could fall under that if uh, it couldn't just meet the current regulations. So, so I think we, yeah, we, I think we have that handled, but we could certainly okay. look at that a little bit more if we think we need to. So um, uh, I was just really seeking clarification, and I, it, I think you've explained yeah. it. So, comes to mind as you're speaking. Um, the what is it element it's not elementary junior high the junior high over here uh they've got that trailer and it's got a painted mural on it uh west park's trailer temporary classrooms used to have some kind of mural too i don't know if they still do um those are murals but here are their signs the thing is is i'm thinking about the maximum size bit that those those kinds of things even a historic one might be way bigger than whatever your maximum site could be the whole side of a building and i just want to make sure we're covered that they're okay yeah I, you know even if it so if they have their say mascot giant mural of a mascot on the side of that and it yeah. exceeds the wall signage yeah uh you know that would still be covered under the conditional use permit um, if it's not visible to the street, you know, I mean, it's not, wouldn't necessarily say it would be a signage. I mean, we could take a look at that and make sure we clarify that. The street, because I can as, see it when I walk down there. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure they're okay. We got them in there so that sure. they're yeah. okay. Joel, did you have something that you wanted no. to add? No. No. Uh, and then that, that brings us to the billboard section. So this is, like I mentioned before, a new section, but it's really the same as what we had previously had. It's just relocated from underneath the kind of narrative language in the in the uh, motor business and industrial zone for the signage, uh, and specifically calling it out in its own section here. Uh, still carrying that over, shall be only permitted motor business industrial zoning districts and then subject to the following regulations. So it has to be on a lot that's at least 2,500 square feet in size, uh, or on a lot that was recognized by the city as a building lot prior to the enactment of the sign code. Uh, shall be located on property within 50 feet of 95 or State Highway 8. Shall be spaced no closer than 1,500 feet from another billboard sign. Uh, shall not exceed 300 square feet uh, per size or per sign, so that's just per facing. Uh, and then we're two, and so they have a, an angle there that uh, can't, can't be greater than 135 degrees uh, to be considered essentially, you know, one facing. Should not exceed 25 feet in height, and then the source of illumination has to be external, not directly visible from any location or adjacent lot or right away. 
And then it shall maintain a minimum clear distance of eight feet from the bottom of the sign to the ground below, or a minimum of 14 feet if the ground below is a driveway. So that's really, you know, not not changing anything from what we currently have. We currently have a spacing requirement, you know, requirement that it be located adjacent to Highway 8 or 95. Um, so unless something looks concerning there, we can move on. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, striking political campaign signs. And then off-premise signs. So since we define those, uh, we need to address them somehow in the code. Um, so now we're going to say that off-premise signs shall only be permitted on lots in motor business and industrial, which they currently only are, shall be subject to the sign regulations of the zoning district in which the lot's located within. And then billboards are type of off-premise sign and are regulated by section L above and just pointing it back to the previous section. Um, but yeah, just essentially saying that you're, you know, this is really not changing anything than what we currently do, just breaking it out and specifically calling it out. So right now, um, you're allowed off-premises signs in those two zones, but they have to meet current regulations. So if you have three freestanding signs on a current lot and you want to put an off-premise freestanding sign on the lot, you're only entitled to three, you can't have one. If you have, you know, maybe the lot's entitled to have three, you only have two, somebody wants to do an off-premise sign, they certainly can do that. Um, so, you know, another example, there was a recent, kind of at the furniture center, that would be technically an off-premise sign. There was a recent LED dynamic display sign that was put up there. It was technically not a billboard, but a freestanding sign. Um, and that would be similar to, it just controlled underneath the current regulations of that zoning district. And then I think we had we'd reviewed this before. This is really just what we had done as far as taking it out of the narrative format and putting it in the table format, much like our use table and bulk and dimensional mm -hmm. table and limitations on use table. So, um, you know, not a whole lot's changed here uh, as far as what the current regulations are. We've just put it in table format. There are some distinctions between different zones that really, you know, in residential zones, you know, kind of hard to draw a distinction across them all, except for maybe multifamily. So we've kind of just leveled that out a little bit instead of just this gradation of, of sizes. It's just mainly been kind of one consistent sign across those zones. Um, but yeah, you know, nothing's really changed as far as the size or the height of the different types of signs. You know, we go through freestanding, monument, projecting. Uh, suspended, roof, wall signs, uh, portable signs, and these were really what we had, you know, worked on before. I guess one change uh, that we did make here was the number of signs. So these are, you know, what we talked about before with portable signs, you got sandwich board signs, and then the freestanding banner signs. Um, and so nothing's really changed as far as how, what the size of them are, where they're located at. But we were running into an issue with downtown and central business as far as the number of signs, you know, sandwich board signs. Yep. Previously said that uh, you were only entitled to have one uh, per lot. And so, you know, what would happen would be that you had multiple tenants in a single building or lot and the first business in to get a sign permit for a portable sign was essentially given the sandwich board and then the others were told well you know you can't have a sign permit because you're only entitled to one uh, and then we'd see you know them just go ahead and put it out anyway type of thing and so um, I think the you know the best I think that every you know downtown every business should really be entitled to a sandwich board sign um, and so that's one change we did make in, in central business and then uh, the other zones that, that do allow uh, sandwich boards, urban mixed commercial, general business, uh, just saying that it's one per business instead of one per lot. And so we don't, we're not officiating between who can and can't have one and everybody gets the equal opportunity to, to you know, advertise their business. 
we still do have all the regulations as far as you know you have to keep a certain distance clear distance for sidewalk you know it has to be directly in front of the business it serves you know all, all those have remained the same it's just allowing one per business instead of just one per lot um, dynamic display uh, nothing's changed there I, you know this has all just been table format and then residential uh, similar nothing's changed there just putting it in a table uh, then we're going down to dis the dynamic display, and so uh, we're you know, changing from narrative to the table. So now we're saying that uh, these are dynamic display sign standards, um, and, and leaving these the same except for I think in our experience ever since we implemented dynamic display uh, regulations, um, I think we want to take away the transitions. You know, it's just been something that has been hard to enforce and everybody wants kind of these transitions. I mean, I think the, the real issue is that uh, if it's interfering with some type of traffic control device and just flashing constantly, those are the instances that uh, we have concern with. And so, you know, what we propose here is just to strike the transition. So what we had before was transitioning from one image or display to the next image or display shall be accomplished in two seconds or less. Fading, scrolling, or dissolving effects may be used as part of the transition. Um, you know, some people take longer than that. And I, it's just something that, uh, you know, to, to dedicate resources to go around and enforcing those is, is pretty hard. So, um, it, it, you know, it's just really the kind of strobing uh, that we take care of here uh, in the, the section above that. And then just adding language about, um, you know, any of that the type of activity. And then just saying that imitates or interferes with the effectiveness of an official traffic control device or which otherwise impedes the safe and efficient flow of traffic. It's really what we're concerned with with those of you know there's one located right next to a traffic light it's flashing red uh, constantly um, it's you know we want to have some teeth to say that you can't do that so um, that's really the the only change in dynamic display section and that's it that kind of wraps up the so the Mike changes. what uh, what are our next steps for moving forward uh, I assume we're not quite ready for any kind of a public hearing yet. Well, we got quite a few changes here that we're recommending, uh, or the commission is based upon the discussion tonight. So I can make those changes. We can bring it back, take a look at it next time. Um, probably going to, you know, the the uh, board of realtors has been uh, interested in, in this amendment, just in regards as how it affects them, just with with uh, real estate signs. So. Uh, we'll probably reach out to them and maybe a few other business stakeholders to get input on it. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, you know, kind of move forward from there. And I would assume given our schedule coming up, we're not likely to actually get to a public hearing until after the first of the year? It's likely not, okay. yeah. Just the way we, you know, the way it falls on uh, the holidays. Right. You know, we're usually limited to one per month from here on out to a certain extent. So, okay. um, yeah, we're, we're likely not to go public hearing until maybe the first of the year. Okay. So, uh, any other commissioners' comments to Mike uh, before we go to the next item? I think it's progressing well. And um, we'll, we'll take a look at how it reads with some of the input you received tonight. and. I have a little bit of concern personally about over cluttering with allowing too many signs so, um, by upping the, the number in places, but we'll see what seems reasonable. So. Great, okay, thanks Wendy. Okay, uh, I guess we will move on. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate all that work. That's uh, a pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal effort. So the next item is um, public art lighting discussion that will continue from our last meeting. And Mike, I guess you're up again. This is the item we discussed last time. Uh, it was a request from the Arts Department regarding uplighting 
uh, allowances for public art. And so we've kind of gone through, just covered the recent uh, freestanding public art project at the North Couplet, C in Maine, uh, the homecoming. And just went through kind of the plans that the artists had as far as illuminating uh, that work of art at uh, night. And just essentially three um, fixtures that were uh, appear to be on the ground, maybe recessed into the ground, shining up at the three different uh, plates. And we're rendering at night. And then they talked about other possible uh, public art installations that would be beneficial in order to cast some light up at uh, in our public light uh, inventory around the town. <coughs> so um, yeah, so the water spout, fire station three as you enter town and then the south end of town at the south couplet uh, in the Wren Welcome Garden, uh, Helioterra. So we went through the kind of the regulations for our, our lighting ordinance. We have a kind of a dark sky ordinance, uh, except for certain districts. So residential zoning districts, we do allow some exceptions to that. Um, and we usually limit the number of lumens if they're partially shielded, uh, if they're below an <coughs> eave, uh, not more than 25 degrees away from the vertical uh, on a timer. And then if it's on a motion sensor as well. So those are really the only exemptions we allow within residential zones. And then getting to commercial zoning districts, Mike, so non-residential. Does that include like the motion sensor signs that people put on their buildings? I'm just trying to think of examples. Signs? We're not talking signs, we're talking lighting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the motion sensor, did I say signs? Lighting, the, the lights that people have. It, yeah, the, so the luminaire on a motion sensor, so that would be you know, what we currently have. Um, we don't say the you know, maximum number of lumens. Yeah, it's just going to be the motion sensor that if you're walking down the yeah. alley, all of a sudden the light turns <coughs> yeah. on based upon the motion. Uh, that's what that would cover yeah. in residential zones is the motion sensor. Uh, and then non-residential zoning districts uh, has to be, so this is our... our um, you know, commercial zones, non-residential zones. Essentially, we allow most, or we require most everything to be full cutoff. Uh, we do allow some exceptions uh, for signs. So outdoor sign lighting, as long as the source of illumination is not visible. So right now we do, if you have a sign, you're allowed to, and it's, it's required to be externally lit, or maybe you choose to externally light it. Uh, it's required, or it's, uh, the source of illumination can't be visible, but you are able to shine a light up on that sign. And then flagpoles are permitted to have up lighting. And then lighting and communication navigation towers required by law. So uh, a lot of times telecommunications towers, once they get above a certain height, they're required to have um, lighting on top of it. So saying that that is exempt from our full cutoff. And then we also have this other section that talks about lighting of, and it's confusing just because University of Idaho doesn't have a historic district, downtown does, but they're kind of interwoven here. So lighting of public spaces and public rights of way within the central business zoning district on the University of Idaho campus in its historic district, provided the outdoor lighting is partially shielded and does not trespass on residential property. So I'm assuming that they're just meaning that, you know, in central business district, lighting of public, so thinking Friendship Square, um, you know, street lighting, uh, kind of those historic fixtures, if you're lighting the right of way uh, in central business, it doesn't need to be full cut off. And if you're on University of Idaho campus, it's just not required to be full cut off. I, I'm assuming that maybe it's intended to read central business zoning district in its historic district and on the University of Idaho campus. So that's been kind of perplexing over the years. Um, I haven't really, I don't know if we've tracked down exactly what that originally said, but probably part of this would be maybe clearing, you know, cleaning that up a little bit. Um, but right now, yeah, currently central business downtown, uh, if it's lighting of public uh, spaces, public rights away, it currently don't require it to be full cut off. So this is what the uh, flagpole uplighting 
uh, talks about. And so this is thinking of uh, these public art projects, you know, it'd be kind of similar to the, the lighting of flagpoles. Uh, so it says flagpole uplighting for flags of government entities provide the lit flagpole setback minimum of 20 feet from any property line does not cause light trespass and the maximum lumen output does not exceed 13,000 lumens in non-residential zones and 8,000 lumens in residential zones so they have a setback as well as a, a lumen maximum depending upon what the zone is um, Scott was uh, helpful and uh, provided an example from uh, one of his suppliers about typically you know what they would recommend as far as uplighting for those you know public art projects you know if we're going with a requirement that uh, you know if the commission wants to proceed with you know allowing some limited uplighting for public art projects uh, on behalf of the you know local government and we're going to think about requiring the source of illumination to be shielded. This is the most common practice is uh, these recessed kind of canned lights that are uh, in a well. So they're, you know, the ground level would be here. This would all be underground. And then you just have the, you know, the fixture itself shining up, kind of give you an idea of, of what the, the spread would be. This particular manufacturer uh, fixture has an angle adjustment on the exterior that you're able to, you know, adjust this slightly. I think there's a 15 degree tilt with that uh, once it's in the ground. So that would be a way, um, you know, to obviously control the source of illumination on something that was maybe flush with the ground. And then, uh, you know, we'd probably be looking at a maximum lumen threshold and it would, you know, maybe take uh, what we see here with flagpoles, maybe lessen it, but you know it'd probably be good to have a distinction between commercial, you know, non-residential and residential zones. But I mean, those are the two items that I really see as uh, you know, if we're going to provide an exemption for public art displayed on the behalf of a local government, you know, maybe it's just saying freestanding. So I think, like Mike mentioned last time about. Um, you know, maybe it's public art on a wall, like a mural, and not necessarily giving an exemption for that because they can have opportunities to downlight it mm -hmm. from the, you know, from the structure. But if it's just specifically freestanding lights or freestanding um, public art installations that don't have that opportunity to shine down on, uh, giving them an exemption and then allowing for, uh, you know, the source of illumination to not be shown as well as restricting the number of lumens so that I mean those are kind of the the aspects that uh, we would view as as wanting to place on a, an exemption for that type of public art um, I, Joel I, I have a question for you because I guess one of the things that we're trying to do here is balance uh, wanting to uh, display our public art but also balance that with the dark sky so uh, I, I like the idea of this fixture that uh, Scott has uh, given an example of. Uh, Joel, what's your take on what we can do to be able to light the public art and still stay within bounds on the, yeah. the dark well, sky? Well, obvi obviously the goal here would be to uh, uh, have most of the light fall on the art rather than uh, propagating off into the sky. Um, I, I was thinking that uh, um, I, I probably violate the dark sky ordinance myself because I have a couple of sculptures in my front yard and I do, I guess, have up light uh, to them, uh, light that fly, uh, shines above the horizontal. Um, however, uh, the, the lights uh, generally end up in the bushes rather than off into the sky uh, anyway. So I don't, I don't think I'm uh, damaging the darkness of the sky. But, uh, you know, the goal, uh, I, I guess I'm curious about the capability of the light fixture that uh, um, Mike showed us and uh, the extent to which they can be focused and so on to throw the art on the, on the sculpture because I, 
I I like the uh, I like the idea of being able to see the uh, the various pieces of art that we've been talking about here. Um, uh, Mike, can you talk any more about the uh, uh, the ability to, of uh, focusing of that? You talked about a fifteen degree uh, um, something. Um, uh, obviously, the ribbons of steel that uh, uh, I see in the picture of the of the current art piece uh, might be difficult to focus on, but. Uh, What's the capability of uh, these kinds of light fixtures? Well, I, I think that uh, obviously Scott would be, you know, more prepared to discuss that than I am. But I think it just depends on the type of fixture. I mean, if you're looking at those well-type fixtures that are in the ground, there's some that have obviously with the one that we looked at have limitations as far as a certain angle just because it's flush with the ground you know uh, the ability to direct it and away from the fixture itself are going to be a little more challenge you know they're going to have some limitations there this one it's 15 degrees so the placement on the ground is going to have to be a lot more precise than say a fixture that is completely out of the ground that you can form in different you know angles to shine up at the up at the piece of art. Um, you know, what we've seen in the past with largely signs is that they don't necessarily have that type of fixture that has the well on the ground. Uh, they usually have a just a ground mounted fixture that shines up, but they use rock, you know, some type of landscape rock that surrounds that fixture in order to uh, kind of obstruct the view or, you know, restrict the view uh, from maybe oncoming traffic so you can't see the source of illumination and both those would meet uh, you know for our sign code and the lighting there you know just restricting the source of illumination uh, you know either of those styles would meet that intent uh, of the code so um, yeah it just depends upon the fixture that you choose you know, I don't know that we're going to specify that have to be in the ground, but uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of fixtures out there that uh, you know would have a different spread depending upon what the fixture is. I know that uh, you know I don't know if we want to do this or not, but um, you know when it starts getting dark at 4:30, uh, we could certainly, uh, I think, you know, maybe Scott's supplier had you know suggested that maybe we have a meeting out at one of them and bring a couple. Uh, you know luminaires fixtures out there and and take a look at exactly you know what what they would do and so we could judge it that way maybe notice the meeting for that location maybe a half hour before we actually meet in the chambers here and take a look at a few different options and and lumen counts and things like that to maybe make a better decision I I really like that idea and I'd like to get the Arts Commission involved in that as well if we can um, okay. so I'm, I'm sorry Sunder go ahead yeah my one question would be um, if we were to do that or not it seems like there's going to be a big difference in lighting say I can't remember the piece of art's actual name but the giant pea pod out there and then the fire hose those are solid right so when the light hits it that's solid but our new structure is not solid and so would we be looking at different things if we have that type of art, the, the more see-through art, if we're trying to eliminate that? Um, I, you know, I, I didn't really think about that a whole lot. Maybe the arts department would have a little more, you know, some more thoughts on that. Um, you know, I think those faces that they intended to light up are, I don't know if those are see-through or not. I'm pretty sure that those are solid. They're solid. And uh, so, you know, I think that they would reflect similarly to those other two pieces with the Ram Durst piece, the Gila Tira. I think that that would diffuse quite a bit more than the, you know, it's more of a matte finish than the, uh, you know, really reflective finish. So, uh, you know, I don't know that we'd go to a certain extent of, you know, a lumen count depending upon the finish, but, um, you know, certainly a maximum lumen count for this type of thing, I think, would be, um, you know, should be considered. So, um, Joel and Sandra, and I'm thinking the same thing, and uh, I, 
exactly the same thoughts that they had in terms of the homecoming structure. Um, if it can't be t tilted well, if we want to make sure there's no driving hazard here because it's in that triangle. Um, then if you did have just a regular type light like you do with the signs and pile rocks around it, you're essentially as if you had a well that you just brought up above ground and you're still burying it. You'd be burying it with rock or burying it with whatever structure uh, material you chose to, yeah. but you would get a different tilt. Yeah. You'd have more l latitude. Yeah. And I'm sure that they would have different, uh, you know, s different well luminaires that had more of an angle of the pitch to it instead of the 15 degrees. I'm sure they make some that are, you know, more, you know, more okay. angled than that. Yeah, I think the idea of a field trip might be a good one. Yeah, I like that. Wendy, uh, you oh, you're, you need to unmute. Okay. Oh, there. Can you hear me now? Yep, I sure can. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, yes, I, I should mention that I received some correspondence that was also copied uh, to Steve McGeehan, who's the chair of um, uh, the S Sustainable Environment Commission, uh, requesting that we involve them in the um, in in this, and I, I spoke to Mike about it, and and really, um, just for clarification, we already have a dark sky at ordinance, so the concern was about you know involving the SEC because of the dark sky issue, and we already have an ordinance, and and so I don't know what plan we want to take here, but maybe since uh, they they expressed an interest, at least the chair did, did um, Steve McGeehan, of being involved, maybe he's invited to also attend this uh, testing session <laughs> or um, so he can report back to, to SEC. Um, I don't know, is, Mike, can you think of anything to add to what I'm, uh, you know, those concerns that were expressed in the letter? Re um, yeah, I mean, it, just, the, just like you mentioned, we already have largely a dark sky ordinance, so it's not necessarily, you know, researching the benefits of a dark sky ordinance. I think everybody understands um, you know, the, the benefits of having an ordinance like this. I mean, we were, I think, one of the first communities to implement this, this type of, you know, recently, like Ketchum Sun Valley um, had to have a dark sky ordinance as of a couple years ago, and, and we've already, you know, essentially had one for quite a long time. And so I don't think anybody's debating the benefits of, of having an ordinance like this. Um, you know, we were just thinking that this rather simple amendment to our, our lighting ordinance. It certainly isn't a large overhaul. It's just providing mm -hmm. one small exemption for a handful of public art projects throughout the city. You know, and I mean, we're talking three, four, maybe uh, that may fall under uh, this exemption as far as being able to utilize it. So um, I, I just think it's, you know, such a minor amendment, but worthy for us to take a, you know, take our time, take a look at it. But I don't know it's, if it's, uh, right. you know, to the scale that we would take it to Sustainable Environment Commission, but certainly if we do have a field trip out there to take a look at it, you know, Arts Department Commission and, you know, would certainly be able to take a look at it, maybe a public meeting that we would, you know, invite other people to. But then the other, um, well, um, the other question would be, uh, that was asked in the letter was just really, can we be so specific to allow the city to do this, but nobody else? <laughs> and so, um, you know, how does that get checked out? Will that just be with my uh, with our city attorney? Or, yeah, our, our city attorney would yeah. certainly review uh, all ordinances. So she'll, you know, she'll take a look at that. But I mean, largely we already do that, right? Because we're exempting out Central Business District uh, as well as University of Idaho, two entities. Uh, gotcha. uh, we're lighting okay. the public right away in, in Central Business. So I think largely we're already doing that. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, but I, I'll certainly run it by uh, Mia. Well, the, I guess uh, along that same line, uh, we talked a little bit uh, last meeting about uh, whether private art uh, qualifies for uplighting. You making a pitch at your art, Joel? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, 
I'm just feeling embarrassed that I hadn't thought about it before. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, I think that uh, you know, in the future, I, I was discussing with Wendy uh, that you know there are, are a few things in the sign code or the, the lighting code uh, that really need to be addressed. That our, our current ordinance really doesn't. Um, you know, it hasn't really caught up with the times and, and, and some of the lighting is like landscape lighting. I think what, you know, we would call your type of lighting would be more of lands, you know, landscaping type up lighting that you typically see, you know, surrounding, maybe it's a hotel. I mean, you see it on residential properties, but, uh, you see a lot of that in uh, larger commercial, you know, hotel, motel type properties where they have the lands, you know, small fixtures that are just lighting up the landscaping. They are, you know, uplit, but it's a really low lumen fixture just to highlight the landscaping at night. And so that's one, you know, that you see quite often that technically doesn't qualify as full cutoff under our code. Uh, another one you see is uh, like building accent lighting. Um, you know, typically if it, you know, you submit a, and that's usually the cylindrical, cylindrical sconches that you see on the wall, the exterior walls themselves. Uh, a lot of cities you'll see that going up and down and maybe it spreads only five, six feet up or, you know, that, that same distance down or maybe even less than that. And really just to highlight the materials on the side of the building. So those are, you know, but right now we would just require those to spread down instead of necessarily up, even if they were uh, under an eave or some other type of canopy. And so, uh, you know, those are, you know, a couple of items as well as uh, I think Wendy brought this up about uh, just, um, you know, the, the transition of a lot of outdoor residential lighting to the uh, like patio light, mood lighting, the string, that, that, yeah, the string the lights, strings and strings across an entire backyard <laughs> that that really do ruin the bright dark sky. I can say <laughs> it's had from firsthand experience. <laughs> so I think we have a few items. I mean, I yeah. we we just anticipated this amendment would just be a simple one that we would just cover public art and then maybe uh, in a year or so when we have more time to come back in the future and address some of the other lighting, uh, you know, other aspects of the lighting code, uh, when we could do maybe a more thorough look at that, uh, instead of coinciding with our sign code, since that's, you know, kind of a, a deeper look at our sign code right now as well. So those are my thoughts as far as, uh, you know, maybe addressing those and maybe just, you know, more recognizing what we already have, but may not be allowed uh, under our current code right now. So timeline with that, Mike, since we're moved, you had mentioned that you'd really like to uh, complete the, the sign ordinance project first. And, and since we're looking at that, uh, moving towards uh, early, first of the year um, public hearing on that, we're probably not going to get to the lighting revision, ordinance revisions in a big way until later next year right? i think maybe pick it up in summer next year and and mm -hmm. uh you know take a look at it at that point in time in, in the meantime are you thinking that we would move forward a little more quickly with the public art lighting then i mean i think you know just the way it stands it's a it's a really simple amendment just to allow an exemption and and you know the only question is just what the lumen maximum lumen number should be i don't think we uh you know, I don't think we have a setback. I, I think any setback is going to kind of be arbitrary because it's going to depend upon the right. location of where the public art is. I mean, if we do a 20 foot setback, you're not allowed, you know, and you're looking at the homecoming uh, installation, you know, there's, it probably doesn't measure 20 feet across in that island. So um, I, you know, we'd just be looking at maybe a maximum lumen output and then uh, just being, um, you know, having the, the, uh, the source of the light be, you know, blocked, not visible. Right. So those are the two well, aspects, but uh, certainly um, instead of just maybe duplicating what we have for the uplighting for the, the poles, uh, you know, flag poles, we could, you know, maybe take a field, like I mentioned, maybe take a field trip if Scott's supplier is, is willing to meet us out there to take a look at some different lumen options and, and see, you know, what, what might be a, a reasonable maximum. Yeah, I'd like to see us do that because I, I, I would hate to 
wait until next summer to get to a, a, a reasonable answer to the arts uh, right. commission to the arts department so yeah why don't we as a next step uh, see about getting something set up where we could just do a, I guess mm -hmm. that could coincide with mm -hmm. potentially a November or maybe even well I, I know in a few minutes we'll talk about dates coming up yeah. and we can kind of think about about that so Victoria you had some yeah I was just going to say I'm on sustainable environment so I'm rushing I'm only checking computer once a week once every 10 days and because the university was closed for a week it's been two weeks so it took a while and so I just took a quick look because I got I got the the forward from Steve McGann for sustainable environment and I just made a quick reply not very formal stating you know trying to clarify a few things that we were talking about public art which is currently three things and we are aware of the dark sky and we are, we're not trying to harm the dark sky in any way but I wanted to make some kind of a response so that they didn't think we were just running off the muck. <laughs> one, before we drop this uh, I was going to toss out one other uh, thought and I was wondering whether language uh, to the effect that uh, um, uh, shielding is required to uh, uh, to concentrate most of the light on the art and to not be visible uh, from uh, well in this case motorists I guess um, not be visible uh, by people on the ground I think that's a really uh, good idea Joel because otherwise I don't think most people understand lumens you know yeah. It doesn't so mean I, anything to them. Yeah. Some uh, yeah. some requirements that there be an effort made in directing the right. light. Right, right. Yeah, I think it's a great idea, great suggestion. Well, so I guess we'll try to, I mean, I agree with both of those things. I, I think that we need to have some shielding of some sort so that now the the open question is what would be the maximum lumens we think would be appropriate so if we can right. make a determination on that then maybe we can just get this thing moved through sure right. yeah okay right. all right any other questions for mike uh, is that uh everybody okay with uh where we're going on that uh, that topic mm -hmm. okay so we're on to joel you're you're up we're number five for the transportation commission report okay. um we did meet uh Two weeks ago, uh, the uh, um, first item of business was uh, uh, election of officers. Since our uh, um, the uh, chair and the vice chair both uh, uh, were leaving the commission, um, I joined the meeting a little bit late because I was uh, uh, fumbling trying to uh, uh, get the Zoom. Uh, uh, numbers to get in uh, and when I uh, got in uh, Phil Cook was uh, uh, chairing the meeting so I'm assuming he was elected as chair and uh, uh, will uh, will serve until uh, uh, the end of the year when we'll have new elections uh, the uh, um, next item of business was the Transportation Commission uh, procedures uh, we uh, current uh, uh, transportation commission code uh, state that we uh, the uh, list of ex officio uh, members of the commission runs to about 20 people and uh, most of those people have uh, never attended a meeting and probably in fact did not even know that they were uh, ex officio members uh, we uh, are proposing to uh, reduce that number uh, to a uh, uh, representative of the uh, state uh, highway department who uh, uh, regularly attends the meetings anyway. Um, so that, uh, that is proceeding. Um, the uh, final item of business was a, a uh, discussion of the uh, uh, capital improvement plan and uh, plans for uh, ongoing uh, uh, projects. Uh, the we we heard that the uh, A State pro project is uh, proceeding uh, probably somewhat faster than uh, uh, 
projected uh, and that uh, I think there's a possibility that uh, uh, the A Street will be uh, reopened by the end of October or early November. Uh, there is, uh, uh, let's see, the third street uh, uh, bike lane was uh, mentioned. I believe there's a, uh, uh, well, there's, there's nothing uh, on the agenda at the moment for uh, dealing with that. Uh, there is a grant project, which, uh, or a grant uh, uh, category that uh, uh, staff is quite hopeful about. Uh, uh, that uh, that might uh, fund that, uh, uh, but uh, still a time lag of a couple of years here yet. Uh, I believe the uh, Mountain View project between uh, uh, well to the to the south of the uh, proposed uh, roundabout and including the roundabout is uh, uh, is is now on the schedule. Uh, I believe there's. Uh, um, there's some procedure, and I've forgotten exactly what it's going to involve. Um, Mike, do you remember with, with respect to the bridge on Sixth Street? Uh, I, I guess there's a, a, a grant opportunity that may fund uh, that. Um, and there's going to be some uh, uh, construction during the next year on uh, um, on the Pullman Highway. Um, that will uh, um, not close the highway, but will be uh, uh, ped drops and uh, 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 curbs and so on, on uh, along uh, the uh, Pullman Highway that in some of the areas where things are quite deteriorated. And uh, that's it for the past meeting. Um, I'm anticipating there will be another meeting in uh, in uh, two weeks, and I don't see I haven't seen an agenda for that. Super. Well, thanks, Joel. Th this is great. This uh, first uh, report we've had for a while. <laughs> it's uh, pretty informative. That's great. Thank you. Um, so the last item announcements. Uh, I would like to mention that um, the next meeting, regular meeting, will be. October 14th that's our first October meeting but because of the holiday schedule in November December we'd like to move the uh, second October meeting to November 4th and that way we get a November meeting because otherwise the two November uh, dates fall on holidays so the plan now is to not have a second October meeting to have a November 4th meeting and then we the next and probably the last meeting of the year will be December 9th because I believe uh, Christmas is uh, the second meeting so uh, we'll be keeping everybody informed about that Mike uh, any correspondence or other announcements just the meeting change Rob okay and Wendy did you have anything that you wanted to pass on uh, no I don't think so I'll see you next time okay <laughs> that's in, great in well the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> Anything yeah. else for Thank the good you. of the order? Thank you, everybody. Joel. By the way, Hi, thanks. thanks. The, the Zoom is working quite nicely. Yeah, that. thank you, David. It's, yeah. It's easy. Yeah. It's, That's great. It worked well tonight. It's easy to interact this way. Super. Yeah, thank, thank you. Okay, thank you well, sure. with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. We'll see Bye. you the 14th. Bye-bye, Wendy. Bye, Joel. Bye. Bye.